Welcome and thank you for attending the Black History Matters series presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Victoria Basuto and I will now lead you through some introductory statements. I am currently a senior at Colgate University located in Hamilton, New York, and am an intern at the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. I will be facilitating the series of 28 presentations that will be released throughout the month of February in 2021 and that you can view on our YouTube channel or on our website. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Peterborough, New York, in the building that you can see on the screen where the inaugural meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was held in 1835. Nahoff's mission is as follows. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strives to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Nahoff has worked in coordination with the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark, which is also located in Peterborough, New York, to create the Black History Matters series. The following statement is the purpose of the Black History Matters series. Nahoff supports racial justice movements seeking to address racial inequality given the resonance with Nahoff's mission to address the second and ongoing abolition to end racism. Nahoff believes a significant number of Americans do not understand the current racial justice protest due to their unfamiliarity with four centuries of Black American history because this history was either excluded or taught inadequately in schools. Nahoff knows that education is a powerful step towards ending racism and that understanding the history of the enslavement and dehumanization of Black Americans provides critical context for the ongoing racial justice movements and, and the persistence of racism in America. Given Nahoff's commitment to strengthening knowledge of history as one route to confront racism, Nahoff will present Black History Matters, a series of crash courses covering some examples of neglected topics in Black American history throughout February of 2021. I would like to now welcome our presenter, Mr. Dan. Norma K. Dan is Professor Emeritus of Social Sciences at Morrisville State College, located in Morrisville, New York. Dan is a researcher and biographer of Garrett Smith and the head docent at the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark. He is the author of nine books on Garrett and Ann Smith family and their role in the human rights movement. Dan is also a founder and Cabinet of Freedom Emerita of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Dan to begin his presentation on the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Okay, thank you, Victoria, for that introduction. Today we're gonna to be talking about the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. And one of the first questions we should answer, I guess, is why was such a law needed? Actually, the Constitution in Article 4 guaranteed to slave owners the right to recapture their escaped property. So there is a fundamental law basis for having this act on the books. But probably the biggest reason was the universal drive for freedom. I think Personally, this is one of the most important motivational forces that drives people worldwide. And because these people were slaves, whether they were punished or not made no difference, they wanted to be free. And you can still see this force operating today. You look at people who feel trapped. We may not have slaves, but we have people who feel trapped in jobs or relationships, and they will do nearly anything to acquire freedom. They'll leave loved ones, jobs, homes, communities, to escape and be free. So you can still see these forces operating today. In 1793, just a few years after the ratification of the US Constitution, there was a fugitive slave law passed by the federal government, which allowed local governments, not the federal government, to aid in the capture of runaway slaves. But what happened was that the local places where runaways were headed were in the north and northern communities passed what they called personal liberty laws, which were aimed at maintaining the freedom of people who were there. So that made the enforcement of the 1793 
fugitive slave law difficult. So by 1840 or so, there were many escapees headed north, so many that slave owners were becoming concerned that the economic viability of their businesses was in danger. The stability of slavery was in danger if too many people were escaping and they wanted something done about that. Well, up until 1850, when new states were admitted to the Union, they were usually admitted in pairs, a slave state along with a free state, which kept the balance of power in the national legislature relatively even. But in 1850, the territory of California was applying for statehood, but there was no slave state to come in with it to balance that off. So people in the South, especially the slave owners in the South <clears throat> were saying, what are we gonna get out of this? So they asked for a stronger fugitive slave law, which will allow them to capture and return to slavery those that had run away. And a person from the Virginia legislature, Senator James Mason crafted the 1850 bill for capturing runaway slaves. This was actually part of a very large bill called the Compromise of 1850. And this part of it referred to the fugitive slaves and what might be done in uh, having them captured and sent back to slavery. Some of the requirements of the bill, federal marshals were encouraged to capture runaway slaves whenever they could. And if they passed up a chance to do that, they could be fined as much as $1,000. So that was a pretty good incentive for the federal law enforcement people to be doing their job in capturing runaways. And the only thing that was necessary in determining the identity of a runaway slave was an affidavit from the owner. The person himself, and it was usually a young male that was running away, uh, could not have anything to say in the matter. Also, this proposed bill would offer $10 to the federal commissioner who sent this person back to slavery and $5 if they didn't. So you can see there, there was an, another incentive for the federal law enforcement officials to send people back to slavery. And if that sounds like just a little bit of money, $10 in 1840, you'd have to multiply by 70 today to understand what that meant. So a commissioner was risking losing $700 if he didn't send this person back to slavery. So most of them that were caught went back. It also allowed the marshal to deputize Northern people to aid in the capture of runaway slaves. That's a pretty radical thing to be doing. Most Northern people were not in favor of slavery. They might not have been abolitionists. They might not even have been intensely anti-slavery, but they weren't supporting it. And to actually be deputized and be required to follow the marshal and aid in the capture of runaways was something that was very distasteful to them. So if they didn't go along with being deputized, they could be fined $1,000 and sent to jail. Well, what do you suppose this did to Northerners who were subject to this? It made them pretty angry. They became very intensely concerned about the fact that the South was imposing on them things that they didn't agree with. And the effect of it, as we'll see more in a few minutes, was to mobilize these people in the North against slavery. It was really a recruitment tool for the anti-slavery movement, which was exactly the opposite of what the Southerners had intended. So by 1850, what we're looking at is a bill that is maybe going to be signed by the U.S. President Fillmore at the time to become a law and be enforced. So what happens in central New York? Central New York was a radical place for anti-slavery people or a bunch of folks who lived around central New York who were really hot, passionate anti-slavery folks, folks like John Brown and Harriet Tubman and Garrett Smith and Frederick Douglass are all up here in upstate New York. And two of those people, Frederick Douglass and Garrett Smith, 
got together and organized an anti-fugitive slave law convention in April, in August of 1850, just before the law was signed by the president. They met in the village of Casanova, which is just 10 miles up the road from where I am. I'm in Peterborough. And th at that fugitive slave law convention, there were a number of runaway slaves. Frederick Douglass was there, and in the daguerreotype of this, a very rare daguerreotype because it was taken outdoors. Most daguerreotypes were headshots indoors. This one shows Ger Garrett Smith standing with his arm raised, Frederick Douglass sitting at the table in front of him, and a number of other important Central New York abolitionists standing around them. And the things that were important about this convention one is that daguerreotype because it is so rare. And the other is that the members of the convention wrote a letter to the slaves. They addressed it to the slaves who were still in slavery. And I wanna read you a couple of sentences from that letter, which was actually written by Garrett Smith. Quote, you are exempt from all expectations to respect slave owners for you are prisoners of war in a country that is unrivaled for its injustice, cruelness, and meanness. Therefore, by all the rules of war, you have the fullest liberty to plunder, burn, and kill as you may have occasion to do to promote your escape. Pretty radical stuff. Um, and it was not unusual for these abolitionists in central New York to think and speak that way. I've heard it said that if it weren't for the radicalness of the anti-slavery people in central New York, there may not even have been a civil war. They angered Southerners so much with this rhetoric that they shot at us and started a war. Well, this bill did become law. It was signed on September 18th of 1850 by Fillmore. And right after it, a well-known international politician named Daniel Webster showed up in central New York to speak in favor of enforcement of this new fugitive slave law. He was anti-slavery minded, but he was also worried that the divisiveness that this law would create might lead to a civil war. So he was supporting enforcement of the law and he spoke in Syracuse and he he spoke there on the balcony of the Courier building on Montgomery Street, Montgomery Street, and you can go there today, that spot is still there. But what it did was fire up central New Yorkers again because they were not about to support this law. In fact, they were actively opposing it. Well, the effects of this thing, once it became law, one, it emboldens slaveholders. They became sure now with the backing of the federal government, they could go anywhere they wanted and do what they wanted to recapture their slaves. And what that resulted was in was that it gripped black communities in fear. And many Northern communities such as Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, experienced mass migrations of blacks out of the city, whole congregations of churches, almost whole congregations just disappeared. And they went to Canada uh, in order to get freedom. So it's ironic. They had to go to a monarchy to achieve the freedom they couldn't have in a democracy. But that's the way it was. So that was part of the effect of that law. And it obviously increased the divisiveness that was present among slave and anti-slave people and uh, was beginning to lead into a more warlike attitude. Well, one of the results of the enforcement of this law <clears throat> was that in many Northern communities, there were attempts to rescue fugitive slaves. And I wanna tell you about a few of those rescues because of their importance in mobilizing the North. They got a lot of press attention and were well known throughout the North when these kinds of things happened. One, was the rescue of a gent named Shadrach Minkins in Boston in February of 1851. He was working as a waiter at Taft's Cornhill Coffee House in Boston as a free man. And he was captured by federal marshals 
and taken to court and a local vigilance committee, vigilance committees were groups of people, locals who were concerned about the freedom of people who lived there and trying to maintain it. And a local vigilance committee uh, challenged the courthouse, uh, recaptured Shadrach Minkins and took him to Canada, a successful rescue. Another rescue attempt occurred at Christiana, Pennsylvania. And you're gonna hear more about this one a little later in these programs. In September of 1851, uh, some slaves of a slave owner from Maryland named Gorsuch had escaped to Southern Pennsylvania and were staying in a home there when they were pursued by a posse of Gorsuch and his slave catchers. But the local vigilance committee had been warned about this and had organized resistance and killed Gorsuch when he and his posse showed up. And then the rest of the slaves were eventually taken to freedom in Canada, I think with the aid of Frederick Douglass actually. The one that most people around central New York know something about in rescue issues is the Jerry rescue, which took place in Syracuse in October of 1851. And there was a 40 year old uh, man named Jerry Henry, who was a free black working as a cooper in a business in Syracuse when he was captured by US Marshal. And he was captured at a time when the Liberty Party was holding its political convention in the city of Syracuse. The Liberty Party was an anti-slavery party that was founded by Garrett Smith and some of his friends in 1840. So it was a pretty radical group. And they, with some of the local vigilance committee people got together and rescued Jerry from the uh, grasp of local police officials and eventually got him to freedom in Canada. The last of the rescues I wanna tell you about was the Garner family. These were eight people of one family who crossed the Ohio River near Cincinnati and was staying with a relative there before the rest of their trip north when they were captured by uh, federal officials. And as they were being captured, Margaret Garner, the mother of this family, realizing that her children were about to be sent back to slavery, started killing them. You imagine the emotion involved in that. She actually succeeded in killing her two-year-old daughter before she was stopped. The rest of the family was in fact captured and sent back to slavery. So you get a feel for the, the emotions involved in this and the intensity of people's attitudes that this law provoked. Well, what was the effectiveness of this 1850 fugitive slave law in the long run? As we mentioned, it was a marvelous recruiting tool for the movement because it mobilized so many people in the North out of their own anger to become involved in the anti-slavery movement that they probably would not otherwise have become involved in. Also the cost involved financially to a slave owner in returning a runaway was pretty high. They had to hire someone, probably slave catchers or bounty hunters to go or go on their own up to the North which travel wasn't easy in those days and capture this person and then return them. So the cost involved sometimes outweighed the cost, the value of the slave. There were actually 147 known cases, federal cases under this law where slaves were captured. Now, if you think about this, that's not very many because there were in 1860 about 4 million slaves in the United States. 147 became subject to this law. Of those 147, 105 were returned to slavery, 33 were rescued or escaped, and nine were either freed or purchased. So in the long run, this law had very, very little practical effect. Uh, it simply didn't work in doing what the Southern slave owners, owners hoped it would do. It actually had a reverse effect in, in spurring the progress and power of the anti-slavery movement. What it did do was uh, maintain the caste system that existed in the United States between blacks and whites and based on white supremacy. So it was uh, a federally sponsored legal racism, legal kidnapping 
that resulted in the maintenance of the system of white supremacy. And if you think about this in today's terms, it's not far away still. If you witness the events of the last four years politically, you can see that we still are dealing with white supremacy. We're still dealing with people who are anti-democratic in their values as the attack on the Capitol on January 6th indicates. And we're still dealing with people who feel that white supremacy is the way to go. I'd like to thank Mr. Dan for that educational presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, there is a reference list of sources and websites that you can explore to learn more in the video description. I will also invite you to fill out a quick survey linked in the video description, which will help us gather feedback about the specific topic. This survey will take you no more than five minutes to fill out and will provide us with valuable information that will help us in the formation of future presentations like this one. Should you have any questions regarding the presentation itself, Mr. Dan has made his email available so that you may contact him with any questions or comments that you have. Additionally, please do contact Neha for any questions or if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Nehoff's contact information is available on the screen. Once again, I'd like to thank Mr. Dan for providing a program for Black History Matters. If you would like to, I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey. Please remember that we will be releasing a new presentation each day of this month, and we hope to see you at our future presentations. Thank you.